So it was just a mindset shift and it was really subtle. And I think it's important for people to hear that because you know, I don't have necessarily weight issues. I don't have blood sugar issues. Most people you know, searching for health related topics are trying to lose body fat, trying to balance your blood sugar. But I have other issues that I'm dealing with and I, we need to have a positive mindset that our body and our mind are malleable. Hey everyone, welcome to Health Theory. Today's guest is Mike Mutzel. He holds a master's degree in clinical nutrition and teaches leading edge science to healthcare professionals for the prevention of chronic disease. He's created roughly 20 courses on health related topics as well as hosting an awesome and widely respected podcast called High Intensity Health. He's also the author of Belly Fat Effect, the real secret about how your diet, intestinal health, and gut bacteria help you burn fat. And speaking of burning fat, we were just talking before we started rolling and I wanted to get back to it. Let's do it. Which is your fasting. You said that you don't, you, you're fasting right now, you're about 24 hours in. Mm -hmm. You said that if you have time, you're gonna go grab something to eat, but ah, maybe you'll just go straight through and fly to home. I find it really hard not knowing where my fast ends. Do you, is there any sort of mental component to fasting for you? You know, a lot of us have this ball and chain when it comes to food, right? We're just, you know, we eat at breakfast, we eat lunch, and we worry, we take up so much of our mental bandwidth that can be used for productivity, for relationships, for self-development. But when I do interviews, when I interview other people, or when I'm being interviewed, I like to do it in a fasted state. Now, it, I didn't start doing that. It took me a while to get to the point where my ketone levels get to a, a point where I'm not feeling hypoglycemic and the symptoms of like low blood sugar affect me. But I don't really worry about is because once you're fasted, I, for me personally, I don't start to get negative symptoms in terms of sleep issues and maybe constipation or whatever until day three. Mm. So I'm cool going to 36 hours and not knowing, am I gonna have food or not? So it's just a way to clear the cobwebs, not have to worry about meal prep on Sunday. But the reason why I do it is I actually have a, a tumor biomarker that's elevated called alpha fetoprotein. Interesting. That's yeah. why you started doing it? Well, that's why I'm fasting pro more on a more prolonged basis, every 20- Tell people why, why do you think that it, and then tell us the exact protocol, yeah. but um, give people a little bit of the background on the potential anti-cancer properties, okay. what you've read. I'm super interested in this, so you can go as crazy as you want. Well, you know, there's a lot of research, people talk about fasting, first of all, lowering glucose and insulin. And so obviously there's many different cancer subtypes and cancer cells metastasize and, and they, they mutate and, and so forth. But uh, a lot of research shows that cancer cells can utilize glucose and insulin to thrive. So getting rid of those growth factors. And fact insulin, I've not heard that. So the cancer cell can actually use insulin as what a growth factor? Or? It's a growth factor to kind of pivot uh, their metabolism to a more gl uh, glycolytic. So they're burning mm -hmm. sugar instead of fats. And then we'll get into autophagy in a minute. But insulin's involved in kind of um, amplifying mTOR mechanistic target of rapamycin. I know you had Peter Atia on and he talked at length about this, but this is really the gas pedal for cellular growth. And so it's, and I like to just pause right here and let people know it's, it, I describe mTOR like a light switch in your home, right? It's not good or bad. It's the context that matters. Your light mm. switch is great when you want to find something in the dark, but it, it can be bad if you're sleeping and someone turns it on. So that's where, you know, every time we eat, even if it's a vegan meal or a, a, a animal-based meal, we're going to stimulate mTOR. So just wanted to throw that out there. It's not good or bad, it just is, and it's context. But getting back to your question about insulin, that could be the purported mechanism through which insulin may affect cancer growth is uh, through mTOR activation, which just kind of fuels pro-growth pathways. Yeah, so, so getting back to it, glucose inhibition or lowering glucose down, um, it, lowering insulin, enhancing mitochondrial function. So a lot of people, I'm sure you've talked about this, you know, if we en envision our home being a cell, our home has different appliances, right? We have the refrigerator, the, the stove top, the furnace. Uh, inside each one of our cells, we have different appliances. They're called organelles. So they're little cells within cells, really. And our mitochondria play a key role in helping us burn fat for fuel, helping us think clearly, helping us move our muscles. And uh, it seems that mitochondrial dysfunction is uh, you know, an upstream event leading to various diseases from mild cognitive impairment to blood sugar issues uh, and, and, and low energy, fatigue, things like that, but certainly cancer as well. So we got the mitochondrial function and then for me, enhancing autophagy. So as I said, um, I do lab work. I've been doing lab work like you know, comprehensive metabolic panels twice a year. 
And I started to have this GI pain and I could not figure out where it was coming from. And it was just like persistent. So after three months, this was back in 2015, I started to do some research on the internet and I'm like, you know, maybe I could have cancer. Maybe I could have something. And I started to look, and since it was in this region, I was looking for gastrointestinal biomarkers. So I measured those. And there was this one test called alpha fetoprotein, which is high in people that have hepatitis or hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a, a, a metastasis of, of the liver. So I ran it. And the normal range is zero to eight, and mine was 80. Whoa. So anytime you have a weird biomarker, just retest, because it yeah, could just yeah, yeah. be part of the, the lab. So I retested it, and it was 79. And then I was freaking out, like, dude, because I have a little girl at home. So I'm, I'm, I was nervous, right? You're nervous because that's indicative of having this liver cancer? Exactly. Okay. So because I had this biomarker, I started to kind of believe that I might have cancer. And then I started, like, it, on one hand, it was great because I was more present with my daughter, mm -hmm. enjoying the moment, putting down the phone at night, things like that. But on the other side, I was like, I can't have this mindset that I have something that I... And this is common in Western medicine. You have autoimmune disease, you have Hashimoto. So people start saying, I have MS, I have right. this. And I, th I think we need to realize that certainly our body can have perturbations, but it doesn't mean you're always going to manifest symptoms of that if you, you can, the body and the mind and the diet and lifestyle are so powerful. Um, so well, let me ask you an interesting question. So I know you play in functional medicine a lot. One of the things that I love about functional medicine is that stop worrying about the symptom and get to the underlying cause. Do you think your elevation in that um, protein AF, is yeah. AFP? Yeah. Okay. I, I keep forgetting the <laughs> alpha good. vita protein. Um, AFP, is that, uh, is that a symptom of something else? Yeah, I don't think so. But I was living a lifestyle where I was commuting. I was traveling a lot. I was a sales rep and I was going to Chicago, going to uh, managing territories in Canada. So my circadian rhythm was totally jacked. Hmm. And so it was a, if anything, it was an eye opener that, and I mean, I've been eating healthy for a while. I mean, I got into bodybuilding and fitness stuff when I was 14, not for good reasons, for insecurities, <laughs> like many of your guests <laughs> has talked about, you know, but um, I, I was doing a lot of things right, but that's one of the things that I was not doing. My circadian rhythm was all over the place. I was, hmm. you know, always on Eastern Standard Time Zone then flying back and living in airplanes. So it was an aha moment that, I mean, maybe the universe, God was telling me, you need to change how you live your life and be present more, move more, and really honor your sleep-wake cycles because that influences our hormones, our biology, I mean, everything. So, it's interesting. So walk us through, how do you then use that eye-opening moment? You're taking it at a much deeper level. You're seeing it as an opportunity. Um, you take it obviously very seriously from a, a dietary protocol. You're now kicking in the fasting. Mm -hmm. What are some other things that you've done to, and I like the way you say, honor your sleep-wake cycles. Yeah. Um, I'm digging this like spirituality kind of vibe that sure. you have with this stuff. So uh, how do you think about that? Like how are you honoring other elements of your life? Like maybe the easiest way to ask it is, what other changes have you made? That's a beautiful question. My self-talk. Yeah, I used to have a lot of negative self-talk about you know, insecurities, I'm not good at this, I suck. I mean, if we really want to go down the rabbit hole, you know, my uh, older sibling exposed me to drugs and alcohol when I was nine. Whoa. And so, yeah, and so that really... And you liked it or...? Well, I, I took to it, yeah. So, I, I mean, it's crazy for people listening, you know, I got arrested twice before I was at the age of 15. Wow. So arrested at 12 and 15, shoplifting and then for drugs at 15. So the reason why I bring that up is I felt really dumb. Right, because you know, remember dare, don't do drugs, all the stuff in the eighties, you know, if you do alcohol before this or if you drink or smoke, your brain's gonna be stunted. You're you're gonna have learning disabilities. And so I started to like believe that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I literally I remember my freshman year of high school after I got arrested, cleaned my life up, my dad kicked me out. You not kicked me out, but had me go to rehab, outpatient rehab, the best decision ever. Changed my life, got into fitness and all that. But I really struggled in school. And I really believed that I was dumb. I was like, I'm just, I'm not like these other kids. And back then, my brain wasn't because of my, my prior five, six years. So I had a lot of catching up to do. But that mindset that I'm dumb and I'm not able to learn, I'm not able to talk with people still lingered with me. And it wasn't until college that I started to like kind of slowly change it. But this aha moment that what if I do have cancer made me realize that I can't hang on to that crap because my time, like we always think we're going to have time. I may not have the time that I think I do mm. to impact the world that I want to and leave a legacy. 
And I was like, dude, I can't be nervous for interviews. I can't be nervous for video. I gotta create content. I gotta write. I gotta research because I realize that like, if I have ten years, five years, three years, whatever, yeah, it's finite. Like, right? and we get wrapped up in our insecurities and making money or doing this. But I think, you know, if we can find our the best expression of serving other people, that can be an associate. That that can be whatever. Everyone has different gifts, and I think that's what's so beautiful about the earth. So it was just a mindset shift and it was really subtle. And I think it's important for people to hear that because you know, I don't have necessarily weight issues. I don't have blood sugar issues. Most people you know, searching for health related topics are trying to lose body fat, trying to balance their blood sugar. But I have other issues that I'm dealing with and I, we need to have a positive mindset that our body and our mind are malleable. That's been the biggest change. Yeah, that's super interesting. So I want to go back to that. We're 15, mm. outpatient becomes the best thing. Why was that the best thing and how did it lead to fitness? Um, because I didn't think I had a problem. I didn't think that, I thought my parents didn't understand me or whatever. This is what kids do. I mean, come on, you know, people smoke pot and drink all the time. You guys probably did it too. And I didn't realize how behind in school I was. I didn't realize how stunted emotionally I was. I didn't realize that I couldn't effectively communicate with people, like literally verbally and look people in the eyes, all of that, because I hid behind the substances. You know, the little relationships that I had back then were all under the influence. Mm. And so it forced me to get outside of my comfort zone and learn new skill sets, learn how to approach women, learn how to read. I had to relearn how to read, alphabet, multiplication tables, literally. Oh. And how did it get into to weightlifting is uh, my stepmother introduced me to a chiropractor. And he said, you know what, um, to get stronger and everything, you need to, to do these compound movements, squats, deadlifts, presses. And they were just like, you, look, you have potential, Mike, you need to just course correct here. Mm. And yeah, so that's how I got into it. And you know, I realized that if I can change my body, I could probably do the same thing to my mind. Mm the weights gave me a lot of self-confidence and then eventually that gave me the self-confidence that I can learn in, in school and then I did the pre-med route and everything like that and so uh, without the weights I don't think I would have had the and the ability to change my physique probably would not have had the, the self-confidence that I could learn biology and that mm -hmm. I could actually study and, and do the MCAT the medical school aptitude test and things like that right so I, I think a lot of people look at people that lift weights and think meathead or you're just doing this for looks, but there's so many, so much carryover mentally that occur. And so that's why I love to have all my clients do some sort of resistance training or some exercise that's mm. quantifiable. A lot of people go to the gym and just do the elliptical for 20 minutes, but you can't really quantify if you're gaining, you know, if you're improving or not, because you're just doing time or you're looking at heart rate. So if you're going to do cardio, I recommend training with Watts or power. Um, if you're doing yoga, it's a little bit easier to quantify because you can see if you're getting into a position better, you can mm -hmm. hold it for longer. And weights and even CrossFit or powerlifting offer that feedback so we know if we're improving. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm so with you on the notion that if somebody's struggling mentally, the first thing that I would recommend to them is to go work out. And the reason is the self-respect, self-belief, are I think some of the biggest things that people struggle from and sitting there and looking in the mirror and telling yourself that you love yourself is it's probably not a bad start but it's never going to get you there because if you don't do something that you actually respect you're not going to develop the self-respect. Working out, lifting, it's hard, it's difficult, you have to sustain effort but you do see that loop of I did this thing, I stayed focused, I was disciplined, I pushed beyond my comfort zone and I got a result and I look better, which triggers that intrinsic, like when you look better, you feel better, as you're getting stronger, you feel better, you have that more confidence. But it's fascinating to me how few people are able to apply that to the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Like you'll see a lot of people, they crush it in the gym, they obviously understand that you put in that effort and you get this tremendous reward, but they don't make the leap of, if I can do it to my body, I can do it to my brain. What was the insight there that let you believe that? Did it just seem intuitively true to you or did you read something, somebody say something? Sometimes we beat ourselves up and uh... We, we say to ourselves, I'm not fit, I never will be fit, I've always been fat, I've always been poor, whatever it may be, but like you said, these small steps, and Mark Bell talks about this, just putting points on the scoreboard, mm -hmm. just getting a little bit, a small win. And so I think some people can really 
change your mindset by starting the day off with a small win. I know I can screw my whole day up if the first thing I do is look at Instagram or YouTube or something because then I'm stressed out and I'm irritated that I didn't do my routine. Mm. And, and look, there's days that I don't like working out. I mean, I talk about working out all the time. There's days that I don't like going to the gym, but you still go. Mm. And, and I always share this on my Instagram. Those days that I really am dog tired and I don't want to go, but I go, I feel so much better. And so I'd imagine, I don't know this for sure, but that Steve Jobs, there was days that he didn't want to show up at work, but he mm. did it anyway and look at the magic. Jeff Bezos, many entrepreneurs, many athletes probably the same. And so I think some people are just, their health is in such a state where they just don't have the energy, mm. but they need to realize that sometimes we, you know, how seemingly healthy people don't have the energy too, but you do it anyway. Mm. No, that makes sense. All right, I want to go back to where we started with the fasting. So. Um, I've never noticed the mental clarity thing that people talk a lot about. So I think I would have if I were going from poor diet to fasting, then I think because you're getting rid of the brain fog that you can get from especially a high, uh, high carb diet, especially if you're getting a lot of sugar. Um, but you said that you like to do interviews and things in a fasted state because you're, you think you're clearer, sharper, faster. I do. Yeah. And you know, I, this is, you bring up a great point. It's this biochemical individuality. Mm. And I think we hear, you know, ketones are great. So I need to be in ketosis to feel great, but everyone operates at a different level. I just find for me personally, uh, everything is easier. Um, if you took exogenous ketones, would you get the same mental clarity? Is it the lack of something or the presence of ketones? Such an awesome question. I think it's the presence of the ketones personally. Mm. Have you tried exogenous? I have, yeah. Um, I've noticed that, I mean, they jack your ketones right up, which I would love to get back to because a lot of people are chasing ketones for fat loss, which mm -hmm. I don't think is ideal. But for the mental benefits, I think the presence of ketones has a lot of, of potential. How often do you take them? I only take them uh, when I travel like and sometimes before bed. Which and you take them when you travel for what reason? Because I believe that traveling is stressful on the body in a way that the ionizing radiation, whatever you're, this sounds totally woo woo, I know, uh, but the Wi-Fi in the airplanes, uh, the recycled air, I usually just feel tired, mm -hmm. more tired than I normally would, considering it's just like an hour flight or two hour or whatever. So I like to take them before because part of the reason why ketones are so exciting to me is how they affect our gene signaling and protect our DNA mm -hmm. and affect it. You know, we talked I've about- I've never heard it protects DNA. Walking yeah, through. Through, the, through the sirtuin enzymes and it's a big, long, fancy word, the histone deacetylase inhibitors, the HDACs. These are common targets for various chemotherapy drugs. They're hot, uh, they're upregulated when we fast, when we exercise, and when we're in ketosis. Mm. Uh, and maybe perhaps when we take drugs like metformin or rapamycin. Mm. So these are molecular switches that not only affect our body's preference for which fuel we utilize, glucose, ketones, fats, et cetera, but they affect, their, like, affect stress response pathways, and uh, including autophagy and, and others. So yeah, if you're traveling, if you're sitting, if you're gonna be in a stressful environment, if your occupation, this is a big one for a lot of people working at a hair salon or if they're cleaning homes, for example, cleaning apartment complexes, whatever, exposed to chemicals, I think ketones offer a lot of benefit in that regard because you're helping the stress response pathways. That's so interesting. I've never heard about this before. So um, you're saying if I'm in a diet-induced or fast-induced um, ketogenic state, am I up? I'm upregulating the things that de-excite that stress pathway, or is it that being in a ketogenic state is sort of a rest and digest parasympathetic place? Yeah, that's a deep, that's a deep question. We could get into it. So a lot of, because it's counterintuitive, because right now, if you look at my stress response hormones, I'm 24, 25 hours into a fast. My adrenaline, my noradrenaline, my cortisol are significantly probably higher compared to if I just was eating a normal day, yep. right? So logic would suggest that fasting is stressful. But what we see, that's the hormonal side of the stress response. And then we have the autonomic kind of central nervous system side of the stress response. What we see is parasympathetic tone and heart rate variability, which is HRV. A lot of people, you, you measure it with your ring that you yep. use, the aura ring. This is a proxy of our autonomic nervous system, and that increases in, a, in favoring a, more of resilience. So my heart rate variability is gonna go up in a fast. Correct. Interesting, I've never 
test that. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful, I mean, I think that's the best biomarker people should use. And look, if you're brand new to this and you fast, it might decrease transiently, but over time it's gonna improve. Mm. So like if I don't eat anything tonight, when I wake up, my heart rate variability over the evening time and first morning will be significantly higher compared to if I had, were to have had two meals per day. Right. And so I think that's a good biomarker. And then, you know, because there's so many people that say, well, it's just about energy balance, calories in, calories out. And there's really intelligent people that speak to that. Right. And I could agree that you can get results doing that. Bodybuilders do that. Define results. Short-term body composition changes maybe at the expense of slowing down your resting metabolic rate. Because if we think about what our resting metabolic rate and meta metabolism is, adrenaline, noradrenaline, thyroid hormone. And dieting, prolonged calorie restriction tanks that. And so I think if people, again, I'm not a fan of calorie counting, by the way, but I just throw it out there because, you know, there's some reasonably smart people that think that ketosis is stupid. It's all about energy balance. Why do they think ketosis is stupid? Because some of the controlled feeding studies in metabolic wards show that there's really no difference uh, in terms of fat loss between uh, energy equated differences in macronutrients. So if you have someone that's eating three, let's just make it simple, a thousand calories a day, yep. they're a small person, and all of that is maybe it's a, on a high carb diet, thousand calories a day from a high fat, low carb diet, ketogenic diet. In two weeks in a metabolic ward study, maybe there's not much difference in fat loss. So they say, see guys, this, it doesn't matter. It's just energy in, energy out. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I'm not really totally concerned about fat loss is the best proxy of health, number one. Number two, these are short duration studies. In a controlled environment, people are not living their normal life. Well, let, let's, this, this is really interesting to me and I'm in that wonderfully dangerous place of I know enough to get myself into trouble. Um, so let's be nice and inflammatory. Uh, if, if they're just equal, why is ketones stupid? Or why is ketogenics stupid? Because I still don't get a downside. Me neither. Um, because individuals will say you're eliminating a major food group, carbohydrates and okay. fiber. And they'll say it's restrictive. I think it comes down to trade-off. And what are your goals? If I'm trying to optimize testosterone, if I'm trying to put on as much muscle as possible, bench press, deadlift, squat, power lift, as much as possible, I'm not gonna give a crap about the ketogenic diet, right? Because those are short-term goals, presumably. But wouldn't you still be really cognizant of what form the calories come in? Because I get, the, the one thing about the, um, a calorie is a calorie that makes me super tense, is your cells are made of the food that you take in. Mm. And so let's just take trans fats as an example where the physical structure of the fat molecule is, I'll, I'll call it damaged, it's rigid. So if you're taking rigid fat into your cell membranes and your cells theoretically become more brittle. Is yeah. that a fair assessment? I agree. So that's where like that all seems to break down. Like I definitively do not have all the answers. In no uncertain terms, I'm ignorant to far more than I'm not ignorant to. I just don't quite understand the veracity with which people say you can completely disregard the constituent parts of the food. I'm not, uh, like, forget ketogenics, whatever. Mm, sure. <clears throat> I'm not going to bat for keto or against it. I'm just saying it would seem to me that there's more than just the calimetry reading of a food item that we need to take into consideration. I'm in 100% agreement with you. And not only you know, are our cells, liver cells, brain cells, et cetera, made up of the molecules that you mentioned, the macromolecules, micromolecules, et cetera, but different food and different macromolecules and different nutrients in food affect signaling pathways, gene expression, microbiome composition. So there's a, it's not just, food can't be rele relegated to you know, carbides, carbs, fats, proteins, DNA, protein, uh, water. Uh, we need to look at these other things, so I, but they don't talk about that. And so I've, I've tried to have an open mind and try to get the perspective of the calorie counting people because these are seemingly logic peop logic peop logical people, PhDs or MDs. So I'm like, what is it that I'm missing? And most of the pundits and people promoting this idea will refer to a Dr. Hobbs, I believe is his name, at the University of Kansas, Kansas State, something in there, where he did a study on himself, an end of one experiment in 2011, I believe. Is this the Twinkie diet? The Twinkie diet. Yeah, yeah. And it made a lot of, yeah, everybody's he, but that Okay, so one, dude, when I say I love your approach, yeah. you, you absolutely have to be open-minded. And the last thing I want to do is be dogmatic because you just, like, I'm not interested in being right. I'm interested in having the right answer. Um, 
This one though, this one feels like a religious argument where it, it would seem that the people that say this are interested in being right. Clearly there's just so much at play. Um, it just seems weird to get like so super caught up in that. You can get lean on a Twinkie for sure. I think you're gonna have a whole host of other problems, it would seem. Absolutely, and, and that's why that study hasn't been replicated. And it speaks to what you were just alluding to. I mean, yeah, you can get lean doing various things, but is being lean, the absence of fat, the, pre the presence of health? Does that equate health? Mm -hmm. We know many bodybuilders who are very lean, 6% body fat, after a competition, they have a congestive heart failure, heart attack, or die. So it's not, the, you know, body fat obs can have problems and challenges and is linked with inflammation and where your body fat sits is a big deal. But that's where I think it gives people power because it's not just about your diet, it's about your sleep, your relationships, your stress management, you know, your mindset, uh, exercise, your kidney rhythms. There's all these things. And if you, you know, just relegate food to just calories, you miss all that. But it brings back to what you were saying. It's not about being right, you know. And I think people, and I've learned this myself, I've had to have an open mind, like, because I read negative ketogenic diet studies because I want to challenge my own beliefs. Wisdom. So I don't, I'm not in this echo chamber. I talk about those negative ketogenic st diet studies. And when I'm reading it, I'm trying to have remove my bias. It's very hard. As human beings, our, our mind is wired to be very biased. We're constantly, when we watch videos like this or read books, we're trying to confirm what we already believe. You know what I mean? And so we need to kind of remove ourselves from that a little bit and, and realize that's how we're wired and we're set up that way, but it doesn't mean we have to be that way. Yeah, it's really interesting. So uh, there's no question that we all have that bias and I will definitely lump myself in there. But if your obsession is like, for instance, if your obsession is longevity or feeling good or whatever, it's like you can pretty easily get out of your own way on that and then just steer by what makes something feel good or not feel good. One of the things that at least on a, a ketogenic diet that I find so interesting is it changes your relationship to hunger. Um, I can fast for, I intermittent fast every day. Um, my averages call it 20 hours a day. Mm. So every That's day great. I'm, you know, I'm fasting roughly 20 hours a day. But when I look at like what the primary driver for me in terms of wanting to be open to something is to have an even better effect. So if somebody said, no, 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 if you eat Twinkies, you're gonna feel even better. Oh, rad, then I'll, I will try it. One, that sounds a lot more fun. And then two, you can see like where you fall in something. but where do you live in terms of diet? Are you always keto? Or are you sometimes keto? You've talked about seasonal eating, like how sort of do you structure your day-to-day -day living? It's an awesome question. I think everyone needs to think about what their unique goals are. So for me, trying to optimize brain function, that's just my primary goal. And then when I exercise, I wanna optimize my physical performance. Like if I'm gonna do a lot of volume, I will have carbohydrates. So I guess you could call it like a targeted cyclical ketogenic di style diet. If I'm sitting here traveling, you know, I've been sitting all day, I'm gonna go on an airplane in an hour or two after this, you know, I don't need carbs for that. I don't need sweet potatoes, I don't need butternut squash. So it's mostly a fasted, low calorie type day. So yeah, I mean, my approach is just, you know, have the carbohydrate commensurate with the activity. Mm. So if you're not doing much activity, you probably don't need a lot of carbs. And so uh, when I think about like managing the microbiome and trying to get as much diversity, I, I will eat things that um, regard, like let's say that I never worked out. I would still bring in things like berries or maybe even the occasional piece of fruit or something just to, to try to inter introduce as much variety as I can. I'm talking color so that we're you know, getting uh, micronutrient variety as well, just making sure that I have a robust microbiome that has a lot of different diversity. Um, do you think that's bullshit? Does that make sense? Um, if somebody doesn't have an increased need for carbohydrate, is there still a reason for diversity of microbiome to eat rice or vegetables or fruits or berries? It's a beautiful question. Five years ago, I would have said absolutely. But that's, and that's why I was hesitant to even go keto in the first place. Did a lot of research into you know, how different foods and overall food diversity affects diversity here in our microbiome. And so we know that. Uh, I thought that was the most important thing. And some research out of UCLA recently showed that actually ketones may influence those different strains, Acromenzia mucinophilia, Fecobacterium presnitzii. These are common strains that are kind of like these keystone species that influence the diversity and, and really 
when we talk about when people are chasing, and I understand where you're coming from, but so everyone understands the context, why is gut microbiome diversity healthy? It, it translates into stability. Stability in any ecosystem is resilient, right? It can take little small hits. How do you, over, how do you circumvent this practically? Mm -hmm. I think it's unless you have an autoimmune disease, unless you have severe gastrointestinal dysfunction when you have a berry or rosemary or ginger, I think it's best to eat what's in season in your environment. Do I have a randomized placebo? In the environment I live in or in the environment ancestrally that I came from? I, I think it's a combination of the two. I think if you can keep in mind your genetics and context, but also your local environment, if we take your microbiome now and then put you in Africa, it's gonna be different, absolutely, because the water, the bugs you're exposed to, the people you're in contact with. So I, but your genes are not going to change. So I think it's, it's melding the two. I think you have to, the only diet that humans could eat before the advent of electricity, gas, refrigeration, and so forth, was what was available to them locally. And here we have, and I'm not picking on green juice or whatever, but let's say in January, where there's no vegetables growing in Wisconsin, you're having a celery juice because it's mm -hmm. healthy. How healthy really is that? Because we know that hibernating animals, for example, their microbiome composition and diversity changes with the season. So is it, is it the food? Is it the seasons? There's, long story short, there's a lot of crosstalk between our microbiome and our own tissues. And so they're communi communicating to us and we're communicating to them. And, and so I think getting back to the practical takeaway from this whole conversation is we need to understand that the food that we eat is in being absorbed by us, but it's being utilized and absorbed by those mm. gut bacteria as well. And we need to, as many of your guests have talked about, keep that in mind. Because I think that relationship is, is fairly important and studies show that. And we know that kids that get antibiotics in the first year of life tend to be, have more autoimmune and allergies and even mm. obesity later. And just not being birthed through our mother's vagina as opposed to being delivered C-section, lack of breastfeeding, there's so many different things, but you know, is the dearth or the lack of fiber going to negate the my health of the microbiome? Again, five years ago, I said absolutely. Now I'm like, all these people are thriving on meat-only diets. Mm. You know, if we think the microbiome imbalances are triggering autoimmunity, yet these people are reversing autoimmunity through a meat-only diet. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, carnivore diet, yeah. um, pretty interesting. Are, I hear a lot about people doing beef only, which is interesting. And so when my wife first started having crazy microbiome issues, basically unintentionally, she just was going towards like what makes her feel okay. She gravitated towards a wildly predominantly beef diet. Mm. Are there people that have tried it that are saying, uh, I can't do it with beef, but I can do it with chicken or organ meat or like, is there a sort of variety in that or is beef the one that people consider the safest of the carnivore diets? I think that's where people are leaning, at least the conversations that I had. And I'm not an expert in this space. I thought it was the dumbest thing people could do ever because I had my head so wrapped around this whole microbiome story. And I thought, how are you going to get the fiber? How are we going to get the short chain mm. fatty acids? All of this. But then I, I, I listen to the comments on my YouTube videos. I, I read direct messages on my Instagram and I'm just blown away. Either these people are lying or they're telling me the truth and I really believe them. Have you tried it? Uh, personally, yeah. So I've been doing it for the past three months. and Now, right yeah. now? Not super- Beef only? Uh, no, so that's the thing where it's a little bit different. So, so we do, we have backyard chickens, so we do eggs. Uh -huh. We do turkey eggs, chicken eggs, turkey eggs. Is that eggs. considered carnivore? Yeah, I think any animal product is considered carnivore. Okay, interesting. What blood markers are you watching? Um, sleep, sleep scores, heart rate variability, body temperature, blood glucose, and ketones. My, my hemoglobin A1C increased by five tenths of a point. So it increased. went from priest, which is surprising huh. to me. Yeah. 4.8 to 5.3. But everything else, I mean, iron ferritin increased, which I was probably expecting, eating more red meat, things like that. You um, worried at all about cholesterol? No, because my triglycerides are historically low. Um, That's I, the only one you worry about? Well, I worry about cholesterol when triglycerides and glucose and liver enzymes are out of whack. So l your liver tends to take the brunt of metabolic burden first. It's a key metabolic signaling hub. And so if your liver enzymes start to rise, your glucose is rising, your hemoglobin A1C is rising, then, and your triglycerides are increased, then I'm, I'm more concerned about what's going on with your LDL cholesterol, uh, you know, and your low HDL. 
Mm. But without that context, I'm not totally worried about it. And the thing that people don't really realize is like your body can convert protein via gluconeogenesis to mm -hmm. glucose. Um, there's certain cells and tissues, red blood cells, the neuron, various central nervous system cells within our brain that need absolutely need glucose. They can't use fats or ketones. Right. Protein can be back converted, as can liberating stored body fat. The body fat is, you know, you have your triglycerides and on, you know, your triglyceride. On top of that is glycerol. And when you liberate that for free fatty acids to make ketones, that glycerol gets converted to make glucose. So a lot of people think you need to have carbs to raise glucose for obligate glucose utilizing cells, but that glycerol backbone gets shunted right in, into that cycle. Mm. So it's yeah, it's, it's interesting, Tom. I, I don't know what the solution is for people. Should they go carnivore? Should they not? I think if you have digestive issues, it's worth a shot. And it sounds so polarizing, controversial, but you know, in functional medicine, we've been talking about this for a while. We, you know, people like Jeff Bland and Sid Baker, Mark Hyman, an elimination diet, which was essentially just basically plain old white rice and lamb. That was it. So like, that's almost carnivore in the sense, that obviously you're, if you overdo the white rice, you're gonna mm -hmm. negate some of that, but it was really eliminating all the variables that could affect the immune system. Man, I'm really interested in this. One, that's the kind of thing I like to eat. Um, like if you told me that I could have hamburger and eggs, I'm done. Like I don't need anything other than that. Um, and because I don't struggle, like I could eat a very, what most people call boring diet just because it's the same thing over and over and over. Um, I'd be very fine with that. Like you said five years ago, you'd give a very different answer. Five years ago, I would have said yes. In fact, for a accidental period, probably of about six months, I was like, vegetables are unimportant. You don't need them. And I felt like money. Mm. I was absolutely fine. I, uh, would it, was it a true carnivore diet? It must've been pretty fucking close. Like it would have been um, beef, eggs, cheese, probably some lettuce and pickles that would sneak in on burgers occasion, but obviously I don't eat the bun, I don't have ketchup or anything like that. Um, so it would have been real, real close. Yeah, I mean, so the question is, you know, is, are you gonna make your microbiome more resilient or not? People should try various diets and see what works for them. And I think a lot of people get stuck in this regimented thing where, and it can backfire on them too, they're, they're carnivore. So then when berries come in season, when people might watch this towards the end of summer, Blueberries are gonna be in full swing. Does that mean you totally avoid blueberries? Because there's, I believe, I'm not one of these people that think plants are bad. I think blueberries, the anthocyanidins and the various an, you know, antioxidants have a lot of benefit to your microbiome and to your body in general. But then when you start to identify that you're a carnivore or you're a keto or you're a vegan, you, then you close yourself down a little bit. Mm. So I think in your case, you don't have any major health issues that I'm aware of, you know, that you've talked about. So I would just continue what you're doing, but maybe in the winter, probably the best time to go carnivore. I'm gonna say fuck you. <laughs> and here's, I don't have, I have one health issue and that is I'm dying. So the only real question I care about in every health theory episode I do is how do I live forever? Like if you're steering by how you feel, which is essentially what I do, I just don't know what its impact is on longevity. Mm -hmm. um, if a carnivore diet, like if somebody could tell me, no, 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 a thousand percent, if you do a carnivore diet, you're gonna live to 150. I'd be all over the carnivore diet all day, every day. I wouldn't even think about it. I'd never touch another fucking blueberry in my life. Like I would just eat it. Um, but it's, it's that big fucking question mark about longevity that winds me up. Well, let me pose this question to you. How could a diet be negatively affecting your longevity if it makes you feel better Mm -hmm. if it makes your sleep better, if it improves your heart rate variability, if it makes you stronger, if it makes you recover better. How could it slow down your longevity I mean, or affect longevity in a negative way? I don't know, maybe I'm not thinking about this through properly, but it doesn't make sense to me. Hmm. That's interesting. This shit is so interesting, man. Like, yeah, look, I, I love the experimentation. I love the open mind, really be looking for new things. In fact, to that point, what is something that you're excited about now? Totally improving, I get it, you're not the expert, you're not like putting your, your chip on the roulette wheel, but like what's something that's cutting edge right now that's got you really excited? You know, I think the, the ability to manipulate mTOR has me very excited. So we kind of talked about mTOR is kind of the gas pedal on our cells to grow. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the reasons that you fast, one of the main benefits of fasting prolongedly is affecting glucose, insulin, mitochondrial function that we introduced the show on, but it, it drops mTOR to the floor. And we know that chronic mTOR overexpression is linked with premature aging diseases. 
And so I think the ability through drugs, through exercise, and through fasting protocols to manipulate this critical energy sensor called mTOR is super fascinating. So I think, you know, right now in 2019, a lot of people are microdosing psilocybin and LSD. I personally experiment with that fairly often. I think in two years, people are going to be microdosing rapamycin. People are going to be microdosing various mTOR inhibitors mm. to, to like, they're like called calorie restriction mimetics. So we're kind of manipulating the physiologic effect. Aren't people already fucking with rapamycin? It's a very few and far you between. You mentioned the other one. I'm blanking on it right now. Like metformin. Metformin, yeah. Is Do you take metformin? I don't. I take berberine. Interesting. So the one thing, like when the cameras stop rolling, yeah. the one thing a lot of people are like, yeah, I fuck with it. Is really? is that thousand percent? I'm talking with doctors. Yeah, where I'm like, all right, then. Like, it's one of those. It is only my fear of the unknown. Where it's like, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. And I don't know what kind because they've been giving it to diabetics and cancer patients for a long time. Long time. So uh, I don't know what kind of studies have come out based on that, but it, metformin is probably one of the safest drugs you can take. Hmm. Um, it, it, it's actually very poorly absorbed. Here's what's really cool. So I've you know, studied the microbiome forever. I'm very curious about how these drugs work. Yep. Like it's only 33% or something like that is absorbed. How is it working? It's affecting your microbiome. It's affecting the gut hormones and your bugs. So very safe. The only thing you might need to add more of would be B12 and folate because it purportedly does affect methylation and or absorption. But that's a very safe drug. I, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be ashamed to take, say that I take it. I don't. I take berberine. So I do that 500 milligrams of berberine hydrochloride three days Same a week. thing, meant to slow mTOR. Yeah, well, it, it affects a, I don't want to get complex into the biochemistry, but you have kind of a, a yin-yang. You have mTOR's growth, AMPK is breakdown, okay? You don't, one's neither good nor bad, they just are. Uh, berberine and metformin increase AMPK. AMPK is a switch, just like mTOR is a switch. They're different knobs. So it's breaking down what? crap inside our cells. Okay, so this is a little bit like autophagy? AMPK and mTOR are the key cellular switches that ultimately guide autophagy huh. and govern whether or not we're going to tear down, break down, you know, aberrant proteins, uh, dysfunctional proteins, aggregated proteins, dysfunctional organelles. We kind of talked about how our cells are like little homes inside our appliances. Yep. Those appliances become dysfunctional and that's where autophagy self-digest comes in. And so you have a bad furnace, autophagy in, will help to clear that. A bad furnace in your cell would be a, a mitochondria, Golgi apparati, endoplasmic reticulum. There's all these different compartments. It's even speculated that the ability to break down fat and glycogen, store glucose, is autophagy mediated. Even recovering from exercise. This is what's so cool. So when we feel sore after workout, how do you think our body recovers from that? It's mm -hmm. via autophagy and breaking down those damaged proteins so that we can rebuild them so that they're stronger for our next workout. So I like to throw that in there because when people hear autophagy, they think fasting, mm. but that's just one knob on the autophagy wheel. Exercise, there's a ton of data showing that exercise enhances autophagy because you're causing your body to dig deep and break down glycogen for that workout. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, I'm gonna put you to the test for Let's a second. It. So. Hiding behind the screen, door number one, is somebody, I'm not gonna tell you anything about them. I'm not gonna tell you if they're a man or woman, overweight, ripped, whatever. Um, but you have to tell them how to eat for longevity and feeling good. How should they eat? I would say, Sally or Joe, look, I don't know what your health issues are. I don't know what you're experiencing but we're gonna get you off anything that comes in a, a box, bag, or a can. So Any, no processed food. No processed food. I want you to go to a farmer that's within a 50 mile radius of you. Ask them what you can buy that's in season and, and buy the animal products that you feel comfortable consuming. I don't really care so much as what you eat and how much. I want you eating at the same time every day, whatever that is. So influencing the circadian rhythm. So there's a lot of new research studies where they're controlling how many calories people are eating the same amount of calories, but if they force it into a confined window, mm. it changes this mTOR expression. It and changes. not just a defined window, but the same defined window every day. You hit on the head exactly. So if you're mm. if you're going to intermittent fast, great. Then eat from say you know noon to six or two to eight. It doesn't matter, but just try to be consistent. Just like we should try to go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time. 
you know, we hear a lot about toxic blue light. Well, when we eat and food in general affects our circadian biology. We have molecular clocks in our gut and our muscle and our brain and our pancreas everywhere. Food entrains that clock too. Hmm. That's really interesting. I haven't heard that before. Um, is there a number of hours before going to bed that somebody should be cognizant of having their last meal? So eating earlier is generally better. Hmm. So you don't, and it's tough to be social too, because here we are talking about food, but relationships are so key. And you know, you know, when you go out to dinner, sometimes you're out to 10 or 11 eating late. I generally advise people to kind of cut things off by 7 PM, which can be tough for whatever, you know, if the person didn't have any concerns about a social life, what would be the ideal window? I mean, me personally, I would say 10 to four, 10 AM to four. And it's controversial to talk about this because a lot of people are skipping breakfast and lunch and just having dinner. If that's working for you, keep doing it. I don't ever want someone to change what's working for them just upon research that I tell them. But there's some research from University of, I believe it's Arkansas, one in Alabama as well, that they're looking at ETF, which is early time-restricted feeding. So if you look at this umbrella of intermittent fasting, within that are different protocols, alternate day fasting, the 5-2, 16-8, where you're fasting like you fast for 24, basically, yeah. 20 hours a day. Within that is this time-restricted feeding bubble, and they are having subjects eat earlier in the day. So they started eating at 8 and cutting off at 2, and that was it. And what they showed is there was a dramatic increase in autophagy just by doing that. Hmm. Changes in hormones, changes in glucose, insulin. But we always think, well, if autophagy is good, more is better. But if we think at overweight people, their fat cells have higher levels of autophagy occurring. It's a compensatory mechanism. Because if you were to, it sounds weird, but if you were to biopsy someone who's morbidly obese and you look at their fat tissue, there's a lot of necrosis and like literally tissues are dying. There's a lot of immune cells. So if you didn't know anything about autophagy and you looked at adipocytes and obesity, you would think autophagy is bad because it's upregulated. Right. And so I just want people to understand in certain cancers, utilize autophagy upregulation to avert the immune system to help it. So it's interesting. So it's not this clear, some it's good or bad. It's contextualized mm. and tissue specific. Mm. And sometimes more is not better. So that a lot of people are doing, hey, I did a 24 hour fast. Why, let's just roll it out to 96 hours, 72 hours. Well, what are your goals? Why are you doing this? Sometimes more is not better. And when isn't it better? Because so if I knew, for instance, that um, fasting 100% would keep you cancer free, but you have to do, let's say, a 14 day fast, I would do it. I would yeah. do it every year. So when is, when is too much too much? You know, I, I think when is too much is when it affects your sleep, when it affects your recovery, hmm. your muscle performance when you start seeing negative side effects. When is it ideal? I, when you feel good? I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the ideal situation is. Is that really true? So when I think, okay, so now let's make it real practical for me. Yeah. I'll just be selfish for a minute. So uh, I hate doing a five day fast because my productivity falls through the fucking roof or floor um, after 72 hours. 72 hours is very doable. I can stay focused. I still have energy, all that. But the last two days are gnarly and I, I start feeling sick and, and I'm just slowing down and I don't have my energy and I find myself zoning out. So if it isn't advantageous, I want to stop doing it. But I know that my motives aren't pure, so I'm going to need some compelling evidence here. Here's my thought is autophagy, you know, is influenced by circadian rhythms, by epigenetics and whatever. Just like exercise, why not make it more consistent and shorter? Hmm. So every week, do a 24-hour fast. Does everyone need to do that? No. But if you're looking for longevity like you are, and then every quarter, do a little bit of a longer one, like three days or two days or whatever, right? So you, there's a little bit more consistency. Because if you, I did the math, if you look at over the course of a year, you fast every Monday for 24 hours. If you don't do any other prolonged fast besides that, you're fasting for 16% of the entire calorie year. Mm. That gets you pretty close to that 20% calorie restriction that's well known and it's a good proxy for longevity enhancement, at least in animals and other humans, without having to really restrict yourself. Anything else above that in my eyes is just bonus. So if you do a three day fast or a four day fast every six months, that's just icing on the cake and that can get you closer to that 20%. Mm. 
All right. Yeah. Okay. Where can people find you? Yeah, so my website, pretty active on YouTube and Instagram. High Intensity Health is the website. Uh, Instagram, metabolic underscore Mike. And I have used your podcast a thousand times in prep for this very show. So it's been a lot of fun to have you on here. I've spent a lot of time uh, listening to you interview people and, and go really deep on some awesome topics. And then one last question for you. If you were gonna have people make one change that would have the biggest impact on their health, what one change would you have them make? Yeah, prioritize their sleep. You know, so much magic happens in sleep and a lot of us, due to our busy lives, social media connections, we're, we're on our phones in bed, we're not really you know, prioritizing sleep like we do in other areas. And I know that catches up mm -hmm. to us later, especially in our children. And children are uniquely susceptible to sleep imbalances and now the kids have phones. So we need to make sure to make wherever we sleep in our home, apartment, condo, wherever it is, that is like a haven that mm -hmm. is forcing you to get that repair that you need. Because just living, just thinking, just being awake during the day, it creates metabolic stress, metabolic garbage that you need to eliminate that only happens when you sleep. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. I'm with that. All right. Mike, thank you Thanks so, so much, much for coming buddy. on the a lot show. Of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Boom. Bam. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for watching and being a part of this community. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. You're gonna get weekly videos on building a growth mindset, cultivating grit, and unlocking your full potential.